So Boolean operations is a quite advanced part design method and uh, it has its own applications. So before I start uh, talking about parametric design and inserting formulas, equations, and so on and so forth, let me first go through this few lectures, these few lectures on Boolean operators and then go to parametric. And I have added these slides for Boolean operation at the very end of part design lecture. So at the end of uh, lecture number six for part design, I added these few lectures. So Boolean operators are like the Boolean algebra that you learn in uh, high school or maybe here at a freshman level course. So if you consider each part as a set of points, basically, so this is part A, this is part B. When you do AND or intersection between the two parts, you find the portion that belongs to both parts. If you do addition or OR, or here we call it union, then you are just adding everything that belongs to both of them. But the part that belongs to uh, both at the same time, the intersection, you just count it one time. And subtraction of A and B, which is here, we call it a knot, or remove, we call it, is basically considering A, but any part that it has in common with B, you take it out. Okay, so using these operations, we can create uh, advanced uh, parts, advanced components. Now, here is a simple case. Let's say you want to create this u-shaped member with the holes inside well of course you can basically draw the u profile extruded and then do a cut extrude of a circle that's one way another alternative way is if you have a cube and then you have this pad two and then subtract pad two from pad one you get the u member and then if you create a cylinder and then subtract the cylinder from you you can get this one now, in this case, it does not really show its advantage because actually creating the block, this pad number two, this uh, prism, and then this uh, cylinder, position them properly, and then applying the remove operation twice is going to take much more time than doing an extrude and a cut extrude. So it does not really show its advantage when the part is simple, but when the part is complicated like remember i told you inside the class that when you have a wing inside the wing we have at least two internal structures one is called rib the other one is called spar remember that so uh spars and ribs inside the wing so if you remember I told you that inside the wing, these are these um, these are the uh, internal structures that have the same kind of shape as the airfoil, and they are repeated from the uh, root of the wing to the tip of the wing every so many percent of the wingspan. Then you also have this longitudinal elements from the root to the tip along the span of the wing, which we call them spars. Now, the spars, if you remember, their shape is not super simple. Why? Because if you remember in uh, the sketch lecture that we had, the sketcher workbench, the top profile and the bottom, uh, the top uh, curve and the bottom curve of them comes from the top and bottom SP line of the airfoil, while the um, left and right parts are straight edges and in many wings as i told you the uh, root of the wing profile is quite bigger than the tip of the wing so when you want to create this wing this green object you have to use a multi-section and so if you look at the entire uh, spar if you look at the entire spar actually the uh, cross section of it which as I said, at each point is two straight lines and two small portions of the SP line. The size of it is different. So that cross section is bigger here toward the root 
and it is smaller here toward the tip of the wing. So it has a draft angle, and the draft angle is many times, it's not even a constant draft angle. So this is a complicated, uh, basically, uh, loft, if you want to create that. Now, another way to do it, which is quite easier, is this. You create the wing by a multi-section. Then all you need to do, you create basically this plate in red. And if you now apply an intersection or end operator between the uh, plate and the wing, what would you get? You get the part that belongs to both. And that is your spar. As simple as that, right? Or if instead you rotate this plate and uh, basically do it perpendicular to the current direction, so uh, parallel to the airfoil, and you use several of them if you want, several of these plates. If you add those plates with the wing, what would you get? True, you get the ribs. So many complicated objects you can actually get with Boolean operations a lot easier and faster than you can get them with uh, traditional tools of loft, sweep, uh, extrude, cut extrude, revolve, and so on and so forth, okay? So it is worth it that we at least learn how to do this. Now, this is the Boolean operation toolbar, which when you go to part design, this is not active. So you have to first activate it and bring it up. And then the other important thing is when you do Boolean operation, you cannot do Boolean operation between features inside a part. You need two separate parts to create a Boolean operation. And for that, we need to add a new body. So let me show you what I mean by all of this. So here we go to start mechanical design part design. And then um, here, as I told you, the Boolean operation toolbar is actually not on the right or the bottom. Even if you pull all of them out, you're not going to see it. But as I said, if you right click here, okay, and then you can see here it's called boolean operation you see there is no check mark next to it so it's not active but if you click on it and check mark it now that guy is there and it's hidden so if i bring some of these toolbars out i can reach it there we go so this is this toolbar okay now let's do something similar to the spar okay so it's not going to be perfect air foil, but uh, we'll try to do something similar to that. Let's make a spar of a wing to see the real application of this. So what I do here is I click on the YZ or front plane, and then I use two SP lines and create an approximate airfoil. So this is the top part, SP line, and then this is the bottom part. Then I get out of here and assume that this is the uh, root of the airfoil. So now in another plane, on another plane parallel to this original plane, I would create the airfoil for tip of the wing. So the first thing I do, I create a plane parallel to this in the reverse direction with some good distance, let's say 300 mil. Let's even make it bigger, 500 mil or so. Okay, and then on this guy, I'm gonna create a another airfoil similar to this but different size and uh, maybe a little different shape especially different size for sure so what I do I choose these two guys and then I project them onto this new plane they go yellow because they are depending on the original skate so I right click on these guys both of them and then what so I hold down control, multi-select, right click, go and isolate them first. 
So now they are separate from the original sketch. The other thing I do, I choose these two guys. Okay. So for a moment, let me just hide this and hide that. So I choose this one and this one, and now I want to scale them down. Okay. So I go here under uh, scale, and then I don't keep the duplicate mode on it says what is the center of scaling i choose this tip point and then i use a scaling ratio like 0.6 or so so i scale them down and now if i bring this guy back and you can see that now i have two different airfoils now i use my multi-section and i choose both of these guys as my profiles and then i use a ratio coupling and look at the preview and there we go okay so now I got a very simplified version of an airplane wing now as I said if you go on this plane let's say or this plane doesn't matter if you go on this plane and then you draw a narrow rectangle like this let's say get out extrude this guy up let me see it from the front view so that i exactly know what i'm doing make this a little bigger maybe 30 mil or 40 and then i do mirror extent like this okay and i can change the color of this so that they are better visible so i make this like red okay so now if you see if i can do the cross section of this guy with the wing i should uh, not the cross section I'm, I'm sorry the intersection if i get the intersection or end it with the wing i should get the spar right so let's do that let me move this a little bit toward the center of the wing, something like that. And uh, yeah, that's good enough. So now, if I go here to Boolean operation, those three AND, OR, and NOT are all under the second tool. So you can see ADD, we have ADD. ADD is OR basically here, union. Then we have remove, which is subtraction. And then we have what? Intersection. So that's what we want, intersection. And then I say, I want intersection of this guy with the wing. But you see, it immediately gives you error. And say, hey, both of these pads, or this multi-section and this pad that you try to end them together, they both belong to the same body. You need to select another body. You need one of these pads to belong to one part body, the other one to belongs to another to belong to another part body. If both of them, as you see, belong to the same part body, you cannot do it. So what should I do? I go under insert and say, hey, insert a new part body for me. And I do that. And then I would cut this guy out and put it in this body so i right click and say what cut then i right click on this body too and say what paste so now if you look pad 2 belongs to body 2 while multi-section belongs to body 1 by the way if you want to change the name of these guys you can do that so you can right click go to properties and then under feature properties instead of calling it part body i can call it the wing skin right and this one i you can also do the same thing and call it like plate okay so now if you add these two guys together you can get your spar so we click here it says what is that i say i want this one Okay, intersect this to, so intersect plate to wing skin, and there we go. Okay, so now if you look, you see clearly there is a draft, and clearly if you look at the cross section, 
it is a complicated cross section, okay? Because this guy and this guy are actually SP lines. They are small portions. They look kind of like a line, but they are not really. And um, these two sides are straight. These two are a portion of SP line. And as I said, when you look from the side, then you have a what? You have also a draft angle. So you have several variations along this member, but now you can see I can easily do it with a uh, Boolean operation. Okay, so here you learn two things. One, how to insert a new body, how to cut and paste some features from one body to another, how to change the name of a part body and how to apply a, uh, a Boolean operation between two bodies. Okay, you can also do union or you can do subtract, right? So here, if you subtract that plate from the wing, you're going to get two separate wing sections, one on the left of it, one on the right, right? So, uh, right? So I can just show you that. So it says subtract what from what? I say subtract this guy from the wing. And look. Yeah. I got the portion that belongs to both out and removed it from the wing. And that's what I have. So you can do union. Then it makes both of them one object and so on and so forth. So uh, I just wanted you to know about this uh, very important thing. Okay, so now that we are good, let's go and look at the new lecture on doing the advanced parametric design. Okay, so in part design, there is one toolbar we haven't uh, discussed about yet, and that is the knowledge toolbar, this guy here, using which we can create basically um, formulas, equations, and so on and so forth. So uh, the first question is, where is parametric design used when you want to create mechanical parts or anything? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. One is in a bolt and a nut. So um, in a bolt and a nut, especially if you just look at the bolt for the moment, there is a diameter, which is the diameter of the shaft of the bolt. We call it the major or big diameter. We show it with cap D. And then if this diameter of the shaft is D, then not every other dimension that you see in the bolt or the knot or the washer are just random selections. They depend on each other. Let me make it bigger. So, uh, for example, as I said, if this diameter is D, then the height of the head of the bolt is three quarter of a D. You cannot just find a bolt in the market where the size of this head is a tenth of a D or one and a half D or something like that. These are standard designs and the parts that are on the shelves of uh, let's say Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, here and there, hardware stores, they are all made according to standards, okay? And many of the dimensions are all function of a few fundamental dimensions. We call them parameters. So in a bolt, the most important parameter is this major diameter D. As I said, the size of this head for the bolt is a quarter of the D. The size of the knot is one full D. The thickness for the washer is 15% of D. The amount of thread, the length of thread typically is 2D. And then uh, the size of this hexagon, right, that you use, it's a hex bolt. The corner to corner dimension is 2D for uh, the bolt and knot and uh, the diameter of the uh, washer is 2D plus 4 mil. 
Okay, so you see that many dimensions actually do depend on this D. So that if you change D, then all those other dimensions would also change accordingly. Okay, so if you create one type of bolt, let's say an M4 bolt or something, then once you change that to another type of uh, bolt, let's say an M8, a bigger, uh, or M10, a bigger type of bolt, then the entire bolt is scaled according to these formulas. Okay? The other example is gear. Gear actually has a few parameters, and creating gears, as I said, we try to do it as in-class activity, but it is a non-trivial task because one of the things is the profile of the teeth for each gear is not a, a simple profile. Actually, it is a complicated profile and creating this profile, which is called involute curve, is not a simple thing to do. So let me first very briefly and fast explain what I'm talking about. So, uh, first of all, as I said, this uh, profile of the tooth, of the gear, most of it, from here to here, this guy, this profile, is not just a random profile. It's not like a, a S-P-line or a circular curve or something. This is a special kind of curve which we call involute curve. So involute curve is a special type of curve that we'll see the definition of it during the in-class activity that we do, but um, it has equation of its own. Okay? That equation is not a simple equation there is angle and tangent of angle in it. And uh, why should the profile of the tooth of a gear be like that? Because if I, let's say this is, these are two gears that are working together. And this is the input gear with some radius. And this is the, uh, so when we say radius, we use a, imaginary circle called the pitch circle so this is let's say this is r of the input and then this is radius of the output gear and then let's say this is omega n correct this is the rpm using which the first gear is rotating then this is omega out this is the angular velocity of the output gear then if we have this involute curve, you can show that omega out over omega in is equal to radius in over radius out. Now, assume that this guy is coming from motor. So let's say the motor is connected, the engine of the car is connected to this, not motor, let's just focus on car engine. And this guy is connected to the wheels. So these are the gears inside what? The transmission, okay? So let's say this is the transmission of your car. The engine RPM and power comes to an input gear, then it is reduced or increased depending on what type of gear are meshed here together and then uh, and torque out and rpm out gets out to the wheels okay so let's say here that you make sure that this omega in is constant in other words you put basically the car on like a cruise control so the input to the engine, the amount of uh, mixture of gas and air that goes to the engine, 
you try to keep constant you don't push the accelerator you don't push the brake or anything and you try to keep the input rpm to the transmission constant also since these two gears are fixed then both of the radii are constant so this is constant this is constant and this is constant Therefore, you expect here that the output RPM also be what? Constant. And so, the wheels will rotate with the constant RPM. So, the speed of the car is not going to change. Very reasonable, very nice. But this ratio and this equality happens if and only if the profile of these teeth are in volute gear. If it's something else, like a circular gear or some kind of cubic S-line or something like that, then actually this ratio, instead of being a constant number, it is going to be a variable number. And what happens then? The input omega is constant, but since the ratio is variable, your omega output is variable. What does that mean? It means without you pushing the accelerator or the brake, your car changes the speed. So you're not doing anything, but your car goes like 10 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, 45 miles an hour, which is completely weird and illogical. So this constant, what we call this guy, there is an important name to it. Of course, to the reciprocal of this, we call it the speed ratio. So this is speed ratio in gears, you can keep it constant, and it should be constant, if and only if the profile is in volute. So I just told you so that you learn a little bit about your previous courses. Now, going back to this course, so this in volute profile, when you want to define it, this in volute profile is limited between several circles. So it is limited between the max circle, the biggest circle, which passes through the tip of the teeth. We call it the addendum circle. And uh, then there is another circle down here, which is not passing through the roots. The one passing through the root is called didendum circle. We are not talking about that. There is a small circle, a little bigger than the one passing through the roots here. It's called base circle, as you can see. And then there is this imaginary circle using uh, which we determine those R in and R out. I just showed you that we call a pit circle. You can see here. So there are four circles in a gear. Then there is the angle at which the force between the teeth is exchanged. We call it the pressure angle. So the important parameters when you design a gear is one, the diameter of the pit circle, this imaginary circle on which the contact point between the teeth are located. Pit circle, the diameter of that is important. Then the pressure angle is important and also the number of teeth on the gear is important, okay? So if you show the diameter with D and the number of teeth with N, then we uh, define one of the very important parameters for a gear. It's called the gear modulus. Okay. So this is one of the very important parameters in a gear. We call it gear modulus or M. It is the ratio of diameter of the pit circle divided by the number of teeth, okay? This is what we use in a standard uh, international system ISO. This is the parameter using which we select the gear. So when you go to the store, you want a bolt. How do you select a bolt, okay? So let me talk a little bit about it because these parameters are really important. So when you go to a, a store and you want to choose a metric bolt, because there are two types of bolts, a metric bolt and a UNC or UN, uh, a universal bolt, the British system. So if you want a metric bolt, a metric bolt is shown with something like this. 
So when you go to the store and you want a metric bolt, it, you say, I want an M10 bolt. What does that mean? This 10 here is the major diameter D of the bolt, okay, in millimeters. So when you say M10, means this D is 10 mil, right? Now when you want to go and buy a gear, how do you specify the gear? One of the parameters using which you specify the gear is this gear ratio, uh, gear modulus, D over N. Now in the British system, we use the reciprocal of that, which is N over D. Okay, and we call this guy diametral pitch. So this is how in British system, this is the parameter that uh, one of the major parameters for a gear in ISO system, they use this guy. Or you might call it UN bolts. Uh, no, that's for the bolt. Let's let's just call it that. Okay, so depending on which standard you're using, this is one of the major parameters of a gear, gear modulus. And as I said, the other parameter important in a gear is this phi, which we call pressure angle. And then once you have D and N, or you have M and N, and phi using these three parameters almost anything else in the gear is determined so once you know the module of the gear once you know how many teeth you want on the gear and once you know the pressure angle of the gear then all other diameters dimensions and everything as you see they are all a function of these three parameters and you can see them over here okay so uh, the diameter of the circle passing through the top of the teeth, addendum circle, the one that is passing through the bottom of the teeth, we call dedendum circle, the diameter of the base circle, and uh, all other things, they're all determined based on, as I said, these three important parameters, M, N, and Phi. For a bolt, it's mostly D. There is also another parameter, which is uh, sometimes if the length of the thread is different than 2D, then we add that as a secondary parameter. So now that you got the fact that, well, mechanical parts are not just made with random dimensions. There are some basic dimensions, we call them parameters, and all other dimensions are functions of them. Now you might wonder to yourself, how would I enter these equations or formulas in CATIA such that when I change this D, then all other dimensions would change accordingly, okay? And that's what we want to see, and that is called parametric design. So let's work on the bolt, okay? So we create the bolt without threads. And what we need to here apply, I want to apply, is one is this 0.75D, and the other one is this 2D, okay? So I want to apply both of them for you here. So um, this is what we do. We go here to the XY plane, then, um, or you know what? Before I even go to the XY plane, one of the things I want to create is a parameter, okay? So the first thing I want to create is to create a parameter D and then make everything a function of D. But since you need to create a parameter and then, um, let me bring these guys up. Since you need to create a parameter and then use it, that in equations or formulas, let me first, before I get into bolt, let me first with you go through a very simple example of inserting a formula and then we go into inserting a parameter and then using it in a formula. So let's first make life simple by a very simple example. In this case, I go, let's say, to YZ plane and I draw a simple rectangle. Now, 
I want the width of the rectangle to be a function of the height. Okay, so this is what I do. I use the dimension tool and I provide dimension for both of these edges. Now, let's set this to a fixed number. Let's make it 120. So you see right now, these are independent. You can change each one of them separately. But now I want to say no. This, this guy here is actually a function of this 120. They are related to each other. How? This is what you do. You click on that dimension. You want it to be a dependent variable. You want it to be a function of something else. You click on it. And then here in this uh, knowledge toolbar, which is down there, you click on the formula fx. Okay. And then you see the name of that dimension I clicked on, the name of that guy is called length 6. It's called part body under uh, backslash sketch to backslash length 6. And it is of type length with that much of value. Then I say I want to add a formula for that. And when you do, now you get this window. Now it says this length 6, which is that guy, is equal to what? Let's make it very simple. Let's say it's always two times the height. So I say two times, and then I click on this dimension. And then it provides the name of that dimension here. The name of that dimension is called length five. So here it says length six is two times length five. And look, right now it is not two times that. But once I apply this equation, look, you see? Immediately change to what now? 240. And now if I change this guy to 100, then the other one becomes 200. Yeah, so you see one dimension now depends on the other dimension. And how do I know which one depends on which? The one that has this small fx next to it, if you can see there is a small fx next to the dimension, that one is the dependent one. The other one is what? The independent. Okay. Now, uh, how can I change this 200? If I want to change this 200, I either have to change this 100, right? Or I can change the equation that I defined, right? So if I double click on this one, you see when I double click on this one, I can change it any way I want. When I double click on this one, it is gray. Gray means what? It is inactive. You cannot just type any number you want because it's function of something else. But it shows you this fx next to it, which if you click on it, it brings back the equation you use to define it. And if you want, you can modify this equation. Let's say, no, actually, I want it to be 2.2 times that number. Okay. And now you see it's now 308. So the uh, equations can be modified by double clicking on them and then clicking on this F, X, and you can modify them, okay? So um, this is how you can modify a dependent number. Now, if we go under the uh, design tree or spec tree, I see the sketch that I made, this is the sketch, but I do not see the equation that I typed in, that one is a function of the other. Remember I told you whatever you make will be created an item for it, an icon for it under the spec tree. Because whatever you do, it should leave a trace under the tree. But I made an equation, but I don't see any tab any branch anything for it under the tree showing that i created this equation so because i have not activated it is hidden right now but i can make it with not hidden it's not activated it's not check mark once i activate it then i can see that equation as one branch or tab under the tree and then i can double click on that and change that as well how let me show you so in order to make the equations visible, you go under Tools Options, then you go under Infrastructure, 
and then you click on parts infrastructure and then you click on display and here you see constraints parameters and relations the formulas are not check marks if you check mark them then all of them will be shown on the tree and now if you see there is a new tab added to the tree called relations and if you expand it you see that formula that i have created and you can double click on this guy twice not once twice and you can get this equation back right and you can modify it okay now when you do it twice you get out of the sketch so you need to double click and go back to the sketch but as i said you can modify it this way or you can go here double click and then click on fx so this is how you create an equation and modify now what about more complicated equations that equation was too simple just one is a number times the other what if we want to make that equation a little bit more complicated at least let's say add a constant to it so for example here i want to say length six is 2.5 times length one plus uh 50 mil right so let's add the constant 50 to it now if you do it and say okay what do you expect well i expect error but let's see yes so it doesn't like it it says units are not homogeneous and that is one of the important thing katia is like me in dynamics class when i teach my dynamics or controls or other classes i always say hey when you write the final answer, if you do not specify the units, it's meaningless. So here, when you say 50, 50 means nothing. Unless you say 50 millimeter or inch or meter or what. So you cannot add number 50, which is just a unitless constant, to length 2 or length 4, which are our type millimeter or inch. You have to add similar quantities together on each side of the equation. And that is this topic that I mentioned, unit consistency. So make sure if you are inserting such a thing, you say, well, this is plus 50 watt mil. So add mm. Now it is meaningful to it. Now if you multiply 140 by 2.5, then you get what? You get uh, basically... 350 and then add 50 to it you're gonna get 400 right so now this guy makes sense right if you want instead of 50 mil you can say what let's see if you say two inches instead is that still gonna work yes because it recognizes it converts that inch back to mil and add it to the rest of the millimeter dimensions but I make sure that this guy is of type length and this guy is of type length. This two is of type nothing. It's just a unitless constant. So you have to add a unit in front of constant and then add them. Okay, that is an extremely important thing. Okay, so, so far we learned a... Uh, simple equation how to add a simple equation now can i add more complicated functions sine cosine so on and so forth yes you sure can you definitely can and katia recognizes those functions so uh no worries you can definitely do that and here when you're looking for a parameter you can limit them here or if you know them, you can just click on them. So yes, you can basically create any type of equation that you desire. Okay, so this is for the first part. Adding a formula, modifying it, making it visible, and then making sure the units are consistent. Now, what I want to do is to insert a parameter. And then use that parameter in a formula okay 
let me do that for this rectangle too and then we're going to use that in the bolts design so what i would like to do is this let's also insert a parameter so i go click on fx when you want to insert a parameter just click on fx directly and then here you say hey i want a new parameter of type and then uh, provide any type of number that you want so i want a real number integer a boolean a volume or what so let's say here m here if we uh, or let's in this case let's not go to m or something let's just come up with an integer number n and say this n integer so say new parameter you click and now you see a new parameter of type integer is created. The name of it is integer.1 and the value of it is 0. You can modify them. Here is the name. So I would call it n instead of integer1. And the value of it, I call it 10. And I apply. So you see, now I have an integer parameter called n with the value of 10. And that is now added for me under parameters tab. So if I expand it, this is that guy that I just made. And if I double click on it twice, I can see the value I made for it and I can modify it if I want to. Yeah. Now going back to the sketch, now I want to make this dimension, which was independent so far, I want to change it now to be a function of that parameter n. So how do I do it? I click on this dimension, go to fx, say add a new formula, and then this length 5 is equal to what? 10 times n. Now, if I just do it and say OK, do you guess anything could go wrong? Yes. What? This is of type length. But n was not of type length. It was an integer number. So this guy has no units. While this guy has what? Unit of length. So here, the two sides of the equation, they do not have the same units. Therefore, you get unit consistency. So if you want to make sure that both sides are of type length, you say 10 times n, which is uh, 10 times 14, 140, right? Or let's say 8. Let's change it. 8 times n, and then times 1 mil, right? This way, you make sure that whatever that integer number is, is multiplied by 1 mil and converted into mil. So now look. You see? It changed to what? 1, 12, which is 8 times 14. So now this dimension is not free anymore. It depends on that. Parameter. So now if I want to change the whole shape of this rectangle, what should I do? All I need is to change n. When I change n, this one changes. When this one changes, the other one changes. So I double click on this guy. And instead of 14, I make it like 8. And look. You see? Immediately changes. 8 times 8, 64. And then this is 1.5 times that plus 20. So clearly, you see that, what is going on. So this is using a parameter and then using a parameter, uh, creating a parameter and using it in an equation. So if so far so good, now, before I go to anything else, I want to go back to this guy and create a simple bolt. First, I create a parameter d and I give it a value and make sure that d is of type length. And then I design the bolt, make sure this corner to corner is 2d and make sure the size of the head is 0.75d. Also, this l is not in general only a function of d, but for the sake of practice, I assume that this L is 4 times D. So I make also the total length of the shaft to be also a function of D. Okay, so this is what we do. I uh, clean this up and I go start a new one. I go to this plane and sketch. The first thing I do is I create a parameter 
make it of type length and then say hey create it for me and then the value of it the name of it i call d the value of it let's say it's an m10 volt so i created that clearly you can see it here now what i do is i create a um, hexagon and then i make sure the corner to corner dimension of it is two times d so when i click on the dimension and i provide this corner to corner like that then i click on this guy go to fx add a new formula and say this is equal to two times d right and okay that and look now it is 20 because d was 10. right so now it's a function of d then i get out and now i use extrude now this extrude is what as you can see the size of this guy is 0.75 d now here that's basically inserting that formula here for the length can i provide a formula here can i say this is equal to and then say 0.75 and then times d can i do such a thing Okay, because D was 10, right? And 0.75 is 7.5 mil. But you see, it did not really take that. Okay, so um, I could not use that number over here to be used in an equation. So what can I really do here? Is there anything that I can do and use? What do you think? Yes, those of you who said right click, you are right. Right click in Katia, whenever we don't know, most of the time gives us an answer, a solution. So I should not just type in that's equal to something. No, I have to create a formula for this number. But how I right click here instead of typing a number. Okay, and when you do, it says what? Edit formula. And when I do that, now it says, hey, this dimension is called pad one first limit length. This is equal to, and now you say this is times 0.75 times D. And there we go. You see it's seven and a half. There we go. Yeah. So when you want to do it in a feature, in the place of that dimension, you have to right click and say edit formula. Now I go on this plane and then I create the shaft. So this is the circle. And then I say the dimension of this guy is, so this is this dimension. Say this dimension is equal to simply D, right? Okay, let me make sure D was 10. I guess some mistake happened. Okay, so this is equal to the value of D which is 10 mil. Okay, that's... Okay, something is wrong here. Because D was 10, not 20. See, D is 10 here. And... So 
look at the equations. So this is here. It says, oh, the radius. That's the problem. So it actually says the radius of it, although we click on diameter, but here it says the radius is equal to, so you have to say D over 2. There we go. And now he used this guy, and you will uh, extrude that for the length L. And remember, I said L is 4 times D. So here I right-click, edit the formula, and say the total length is 4 times D. should be 40. And there we go. Right? So you see, now I made a very simple rough, of course, you know, we made the bolt. It has a lot more detail. But now I made a simple bolt with shaft diameter D, total length 4D, and the size of the height of the head is 0.75D, and corner to corner of the hex is 2D. So there are several dimensions that depend on D, right? So now all I need is... If I want to convert this M10 bolt to an M8, double click here and change 10 to what? An 8. And look, everything will be resized. There we go. So that is the power of parametric design. You change the few parameters that determine the entire shape of the part, and there we go. Now you get yourself another standard part. Okay, so that's what we do. Okay, so, so far, from the uh, knowledge uh, toolbar, we have learned how to use the fx command, right, or the add formula. Now, uh, there are a few more commands in this toolbar that I want you to know about. So let me make a rectangle, add the two dimensions, and so we use this fx. This is basically adding uh, comments and URLs, which we don't need at the moment. We're going to see design table next, but uh, knowledge inspector Right now, we don't need it, and block selected parameters, really. So the one I wanted to show is equivalent dimensions. So here, I want to make these two dimensions equivalent, which is basically making the length of them equal, but equivalent is a little different than equal. So I could always say, hey, I select this edge and this edge, go to the geometric constraint, and use the equal if there is there we go use the equal constraint to force them to be equal now here you clearly see it doesn't like it because the dimensions are different but if i remove one of them like that then now these two are equal and if i change this one the other one will change accordingly okay so one of them that has the dimension will be like the independent and the other one will be depending on this and these two are always equal. Now, equivalent is similar to this. So the dimensions of the two lines will be equal always, but it's not like one of them is a function of the other. They can both be changed. So let me show you. So I get rid of this equal constraint that I made. And I provide dimensions to them. Let me change one of them for the moment. And now I say, well, I click on this guy. It says, okay, which two dimensions do you want equal, equivalent? I say this one. It allows me. Let's see. So we select this one and this one and say I want them equivalent. There we go. And you OK that. Now these are equivalent. So I can double click on this one and change it. 
or I can double click on this one and change it. Okay, so that's the difference between equivalent and equal. Equivalent means uh, each one of them can be changed individually, separately, and the other one would change accordingly. But in equal, one of them is like independent variable and the other one is dependent variable. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that you know this one as well. The final thing, which is a very interesting thing in this lecture is design table. And design table is a very good, powerful tool in Katia, which allows you to make a variety of a part, a different set of different configurations of a part and save all of those basically under the same cat file by adding one Excel sheet. What do I mean by that? Let me show you. So let's say here, I go ahead and create a rectangle, give it some dimensions, then extrude it up then on this top face I come and let's say create a cut extrude somewhere with some diameter and I fix the position of the center with respect to reference locations and then I cut this out for let's say 20 mil or so so this is a part I made I used uh, six dimensions or seven actually to create this part right two for extrude and cut extrude three for the circle and two for the rectangle so seven and now Let's say this is a part that I want to manufacture. Now, also, I want to create different versions or different configurations of this part where they are not all a scaled up or down version of this. For example, in some of them, this rectangle is a little bit narrower or wider and the circle is bigger or smaller and the location of cir circle can also change. So what they share is basically they are all extrude of a cube and cut extrude of a circle, but the dimensions and the locations can change. So it's a little bit above using a simple parameter that we did for the bolt, right? When we change the parameter in a bolt and we created a M10 bolt and then change it to M8 and so on and so forth. It's like basically scaling down or up the whole thing. Well, here it's a little more than that. When you move this cut extrude from here to somewhere else, it's not really scaling anymore. So now, if I want, I save this as like parts one, but then if I want to create the second configuration or version of this, I need to save it as another file call it what part two and then another one part three part four and so on so then i need a bunch of different cat files each one for each configuration of this component an alternative way to do it is using this design table this guy here if you click on it then it says okay create a design table what's the name say design table one is okay the arrangement of the cells in the Excel file, do one vertical or horizontal here, just keep it vertical and say, okay, that. Then it says, where do you want to save it? Let's say under downloads, okay? And as I said, I call it uh, design table one. Okay. So, um, right? Oh, wait, I made a mistake. 
mistake is this. It says, do you want, yeah, you have to pay attention to this part. Do you want to create a design table from a pre-existing file or using the new, the current parameters and create a new file? Since we don't have a pre-existing, we have to change it to create a new one, okay? Otherwise, yes, it is not going to like it. And it says, okay, show me the pre-existing file. That's what I had. So I said, okay, use the new ones. Then it says, which parameters, these are all of the parameters involved in this part. And you might say, well, you told me you only use seven dimensions. What are all of this? It's way more than seven. Yes. Not all of them are dimensions. Some of them are like activity mode or something, which are flags and logical things. So we don't need to export them if we want a second configuration of the part. So instead of showing all of these and make us confused, I change this filter type from all to only what? Length. So I say, hey, just show me the length. And then I try to find those sevens that matter to me. So one of them was the size of this extrude. If I click on it, it shows me which quantity it was. So you say, yeah, this is a good one. I want in one of my uh, configurations of this part to make this uh, block a little bit thicker or thinner. So that's one of the parameters I want to change. So I use this right arrow and send it to the parameters that I will export. Then you can click on this one. This is like the uh, width of the base rectangle. Yes, I want that. Then you click on this. This is the height of it. I want that. Then you can go to this one, the depth of the cut extrude, I want that. Then you can go to the radius of the circle, I want that. And then you have two offsets for the circle and you can export them as well. So these are those seven parameters. And I say these seven are good and I okay that. And then it's going to save it as an Excel file for me. You can also save it as a text file, but I recommend you do it as an Excel file. You give it the name design table one under downloads. You save and OK that. And now what it does is if you go under downloads, now there is this Excel file created. And if you open it, it has all of those dimensions that I mentioned with their names and their values over here. Okay, and then this Excel file is now linked to my Katia file. So if I change any of these values and go back in the Katia, those numbers would change. So now if I want to change this, I don't need to go to the part body, double click on these windows and change the numbers. All I need is to change the numbers, just type them here in Excel. And since Excel and Katia are linked now, it will change accordingly. Let's say, for example, this 50 was what? The depth or the height of the extrude, right? So if I make it instead of 50, 80, then what do I expect? I expect this guy to be a little thicker block, right? So I make it 80 and then I save it. I don't even need to close it. I go back to Katia. And when you go, after a few seconds, typically it synchronizes itself. If it doesn't, you can manually click on this guy here say hey update that for me manually okay and now you see the part goes red when something is red red means it needs update something has changed and you have to click on the update command or use Control u to update you can also see the update sign on the uh, part body and its 3d feature so all you need is now do an update and there we go you see, so now it is updated, synced with the Excel file, and this is now 80. Now let's change a couple of other dimensions. So this 4D or 20, this was the radius of the pocket. So I change that, make that circle a little bigger. I make it like 35. 
so it's going to be a bigger circle and then I make the uh, cut which was 20 units cut I make it out of 80 I make it 80 so it is going to be what it's like a, a true hole right it's going to be from the top to the bottom so let's do that now go back here and as I said it typically does update by itself you don't need to do anything after a few seconds it sinks there we go and then you just update it and now look it is now a bigger circle and it is a what a true hole right so this is one good powerful thing that you don't need to really go and double click and find them and change them all you need is go to the excel type the number and it will change but more powerful than that is instead of adding one row of dimensions now i can add several row of the dimensions so here in the second row of the dimensions i want this to be actually thin i want it to be a thin block i want the uh, circular thing to be a small one and I want the cut to be a shallow cut, 10. Okay, and I save. Okay, so I saved the second configuration. And uh, now, since the top row is the active configuration, I don't get any change, of course. But I have the ability to go and apply the second row to create the second configuration. How? So I go under relations and find this design table. And then what I do is I double click on the design table to get this window. And in this window, you have basically all rows of the Excel file. So instead of applying the top row, I click on the second row and say apply. And look, there we go. Right? So now if I want more configurations, all I need to do is to go to the Excel file and apply more rows. And each row corresponds to a configuration. So what's the advantage? I can create a library of all parts with a similar uh, appearance like this but they differ in dimensions and locations and some specs and instead of saving a bunch of different cat files with different names all i do is i have one single cat file and all of those configurations will be all stored in an excel file so I have one Excel file, one CAD file, instead of, let's say, 100 different CAD files. I have one CAD file and an Excel file with 100 rows, which takes a lot less volume and it creates a library for me, thanks to this amazing capability of design table. So when you want to create a catalog, I uh, suggest that you use the design table. So... The lecture is over, and I guess I mentioned almost anything I know myself about part design in uh, Katia to a very good extent. And uh, we're going to do this Spur Gear tutorial that is on Canvas under Modules Tutorials, the file that tells you step by step how to do it. If you go under, as I said, Modules, you go under Tutorials. You see this PDF file which tells you step by step how to create a, a helical, uh, basically, gear, which is not a, a trivial part to make. It tells you how to create that in Katia in order to learn more about parametric design. Okay, thank you so much for your attention and I will see you in the next lecture.